What's up, van friends? Today we're gonna install a Webasto Airtop 2000 STC gasoline into this ProMaster van. Uh, this will not be like a typical step-by-step -step procedural video. Instead, we're just gonna share with you like the tips and tricks that we've learned installing these into our vans and everything we've learned from our customers over the last couple of years. Tip number one, buy your heater from a North American retailer, such as us, Van Life Outfitters. Many sellers, including those on Amazon, are selling European origin kits that have different parts. These typically do not have the North American warranty, and it's hard to find locally available parts. And when you do, sometimes they're not compatible if you need a repair. We have an extensive explanation of this on our blog post that's linked below. But if you see something that looks like this, be aware. All right, let's dive in by unboxing this thing. This is actually where a lot of people start to get confused because there are so many individual pieces and parts inside the box, um, it can be a bit overwhelming. So what we're gonna do is just take everything out, show you what every piece and every part does. Some of them you won't even use in a typical camper van installation. So if you have your own heater kit, we recommend that you follow along as we go through all these different items. Right off the bat, I can tell you that the Airtop 2000 does not include any ducting, vents, or louvers. Its larger cousin, the Evo 40 heater, does. So if you're installing this heater in a place where ducting or vents would be helpful, like not under a seat, then we've got you covered with our vent and duct configuration tool, where you can easily get the parts you need for your particular installation. Okay, the first bag has the fuel pump, some fuel hose, and the housing for a pump connector. Let's put the housing aside for now. Also in this bag is the squishy fuel pump mounting bracket. If you don't have this nice squishy bracket that cuts down on the pump noise, you probably have a European kit, not a North American one. That's one of the many differences that we mentioned in tip number one. Next up is the fuel pump wiring harness. It's different than the main wiring harness. We'll show you that a bit later. It has a green and black oval shaped connector on one end and a black squarish connector on the other. The green black oval connector goes into the fuel pump itself and the other end is meant to pair up with that housing for a fuel pump connector that we just looked at and set aside. At this point I suggest you snap the two pieces of this connector together so that you don't lose it and also so you remember how it pairs up with its other end. The next baggie has more fuel parts. There are some straight fuel line connectors. These slip over the fuel hose to connect two pieces together. There's also a 90 degree version, which is helpful in many installations. These pieces will allow you to bridge together your fuel tap to the filter and then to the fuel line and so on toward the pump. There's also special fuel hose clamps. Finally, there's this fuel filter that's included. Tip number two, when using these fuel line connectors, try to butt the fuel line together inside the connector. In other words, push the fuel line from one side right up against the fuel line on the other side so that you don't have a gap inside that connector. Tip number three, use Wabasto fuel hose clamps. If you lose them or run out, you can buy extras from us or other retailers. Don't use the standard hardware style worm clamps. They're not the same. It's not just that we're greedy. They just don't work the same way. The reason for these two tips is to prevent any air from getting into the fuel line. You can see how tiny this fuel line hose is. These heaters use very little fuel, which is awesome, but it makes them very susceptible to contaminants and air bubbles. Bonus tip, if you have a European kit, it may not have come with the fuel filter. These are highly unique filters and we recommend them on all systems for reliable operation. If your kit did not come with a filter, you can buy them in our store. This next bag has some wire loom in it that's the right size to protect your fuel line. There's a bunch of wire ties, and there's this grate that you'll put on the air intake of the heater to prevent things from getting sucked in. Also, these six two-inch bolts and nuts. These are used to mount the heater through your floor to secure it to the van. They're M6 bolts and nuts in case you find yourself needing longer ones or you lose a few. Next up is the main wiring harness. This definitely looks intimidating, but we'll show you what all the various connections are for later in the video. This bag contains the rheostat controller. This comes with all of the Airtop 2000 STC kits that we sell. 
It's included in the box as you see. So if you do end up upgrading to a smart temp digital controller, you'll still receive this one. And here's the heater itself that comes packaged in its own box. It's a tiny little thing that's perfect for a compact space like a van. On this side, you have the air inlet where the cabin air is sucked in with the fan heated by the heater. And then on the other side, the hot air goes out from this port. Both of these inlets and outlets use 60 millimeter ducting and vents. And if we turn it over on the bottom, there's this combustion air inlet, the plastic one with these wires coming out. Those are for the fuel pump and we'll show you that later. And the combustion exhaust, the metal one, once installed, these will be on the exterior of the van, below the floor, and that prevents any combustion gases from getting inside your van, which could kill you. So that's tip number four. Anytime you have things that use combustion inside your van, like a Wabasto air heater, please install a carbon monoxide detector. We sell an affordable combo unit that detects both carbon monoxide and propane gas. And the last small connection on the bottom is the fuel inlet. This aluminum hose is the combustion air intake hose that will be connected to that plastic port on the bottom of the heater. This is the shorter of these two smaller hoses. The longer hose is stainless steel and is for the combustion exhaust that will connect to the metal port on the bottom of the heater. Both of these combustion air and exhaust hoses are 22 millimeter. This baggie has parts for the combustion air intake and exhaust hoses. There's a typical worm drive hose clamp to secure the combustion air intake hose to its port and a heavier duty clamp to secure the combustion exhaust hose to its port. It also comes with three clamps that you can use for routing these hoses underneath your van. In this bag, there's the metal mounting plate, a rubber seal, the foam gasket, and some hardware. You'll need all these things and we'll dive into them later. This is a fuel standpipe. In most cargo van installations, you will not need this since Sprinters, Transit, ProMasters have auxiliary fuel pickup taps from the factory that you can use. This is much easier. Finally, this is the manual. I know you're watching this video, but you should read the manual. Really. They include a template in the manual bag. One side of the template is for when you cut out all the individual openings for the various hoses. This is hard. The other side is for when you make one large four inch hole for all that stuff, plus the six bolt hole locations. That's a much easier approach. So that's tip number five. Use the four inch opening method for the installation. Okay, Woo. that's everything that comes inside the heater box itself. In this installation, we're using our ProMaster slash Sprinter installation kit, which comes with three add-ons. First, it comes with a fuel tapping kit that allows you to easily connect to the auxiliary fuel port on your ProMaster or Sprinter using the included push lock fitting. In this case, the push lock fitting is compatible with both a Sprinter or a ProMaster. It also has an additional 90 degree fuel line connector and some extra hose clamps. The next add-on is the air intake noise suppression kit, this silencer thing. Finally, it comes with an exhaust noise suppression kit with a muffler to quiet down the exhaust. These add-ons make your installation easier since you have everything you need and the mufflers do minimize the sound of the heater when it's running. We'll actually show you the noise level before and after later in the video. In this installation, we'll also be using the digital controller instead of the included rheostat controller. This upgrade is called the smart temp controller and it looks like this. If you have a different digital controller that looks like this, it's called the multi-control, and it's another signal that you have the European kit. It is not compatible with the North American heaters. The smart temp controller has a few key features. Number one, it has a built-in temperature sensor. If you use the rheostat controller, it does not have a temperature sensor. Instead, it relies on a temperature sensor that's located in the heater's air intake. It's better to have the temp sensor in the controller, much like a thermostat for your heater at home, where the thermostat can be located in a convenient location and where you think you wanna measure the air temperature for the heater. Number two, you can set the controller to run for a specified amount of time, much like you would do with the home thermostat. 
Number three, the digital display makes controlling the heater a bit easier, and you can get more detail on any faults that might occur by reading them off of the screen. We'll get into more of that later as well. Finally, number four, the digital controller allows you to change the mode of the heater from heat mode to fan mode, which is something you can't do with the rheostat controller. Note, at the time that we're making this video, Webasto has announced a newer 3.0 version of the Smart Temp controller that has Bluetooth capability. That product is not shipping yet, but we anticipate that it will fairly soon. Before you get started on the install, um, you have to find a good location to physically place the heater. Um, you have to make sure that it's going to work inside your layout, but also that when you bolt the heater through the floor, you'll be able to access those bolts and not drill into something important on the van. Uh, the paper template that comes with the heater is pretty useful for this, and you can kind of take it around and uh, along with the heater and just figure out where it's going to make sense both inside the van, but also underneath to access the bolts and all the wires and the hoses that hook up to the underneath of the heater. Also, be sure that the heater isn't installed too close to anything inside the van that might be sensitive to heat. Many people install these particular heaters under the passenger seat of their van since they're small enough to fit nicely into that space. In my van, I'm going to be installing it in this location that's just behind the driver's seat and it will be covered up with a little box. The heater will have ducting that directs the heated air straight out of the cabinet and also tee off to the so-called garage area. It'll also have an air inlet so that the cabin air can be reheated. All right, let's prep the heater for installation with what I call the sandwich. Turning the heater on the back, the first layer of the sandwich is this rubber gasket that only fits one way onto the heater. You have to make sure that you align the hole for the fuel line correctly to get the right orientation. The side with the lip faces down toward the bottom of the heater. Next in the sandwich is the metal plate. Then you use the provided washer and nuts to tighten the plate against the gasket and heater with a 10 millimeter wrench. The last layer of the sandwich is this foam gasket. When you bolt the heater to the floor, this gasket will seal against the floor, including any reasonable unevenness or corrugations. This foam gasket will create an airtight seal between the inside living space in the van and the hole in the floor where the combustion intake and exhaust are outside of the van. Another tip, these heaters are designed to be attached directly to the sheet metal of the van floor. If you already have a subfloor like plywood or a complete floor system in your van, you'll want to use the surface mounting kit. This product has a metal sleeve that can go through a four inch hole in your subfloor and the van metal floor. And then you seal the sides of the sleeve as you place it into that opening with something like RTV sealant. This creates a sort of shaft through the flooring system to the exterior, which protects the flooring layers and makes sure that the seal on top of the floor with the foam gasket works as designed to keep out any combustion gases. Next, we're gonna prep the fuel pump wires that come out of the combustion air intake hose on the bottom of the heater. Start by pulling them out of the port uh, the fuel pump is installed outside of the van, and these wires power that fuel pump. They can slide down the small slit on the connector so that they're at the top or the base of the heater. Here's another tip. We recommend drilling a quarter inch hole for these wires to pass through at the very top of the end of that slit in the air intake port. If you don't do this, when you clamp on the intake hose, these wires can get pinched in that slit and short out. It's happened to many of our customers. Remember that connector housing from when we were unboxing parts that we stuck on the other end of this connector? It's time to use that thing. So the pins on the wires get pushed into the backside of the connector housing. Importantly, the pin's wide surface needs to be aligned this way so that it surfaces through the connector uh, and doesn't get stuck. Insert both pins into the housing and then press them until the rubber seal is at the back of the connector until they're fully seated. And here's another tip. 
The polarity does not matter on these wires pins. You can insert them into the connector in any order. It doesn't matter which side you connect them to. You just need to have both of them inside the connector housing. Now comes one of the funnest parts. You have to drill the four inch hole through the van floor in the location you've chosen. Here I've marked the location hole and cut it. Next, I'm gonna mark the location for each of the six mounting bolts. I'm using the paper template for this, but if you prefer, you can also use the metal mounting plate. Tip, it's definitely worth investing into a high quality hole saw for this. Four inches is a pretty big hole in the sheet metal, so you need good cutting power. We've tried a few brands and the Spider Tarantula brand has worked the best. Now we can drop our Wabasto sandwich into place over the hole and bolt it down into place. Tip, a lot of installers prefer to attach the combustion air intake and the combustion exhaust hoses to the heater before they drop it through the four inch hole. We'll show you how we go about this process later, but just wanted to mention that in case you think in your installation, having those hoses connected prior is gonna be helpful for you. In this installation, I'm in a really tight spot where below the van, uh, the bolt hole locations would be inside some of the structural beams and I wouldn't be able to access them to put the nuts on. So instead of using the supplied bolts and nuts, I've drilled out holes in the bolt locations and I'm using quarter inch riv nuts with shorter bolts to basically accomplish the same thing. So that's another tip. If you do find a location you really want your heater to be in, um, but you can't get to the bolts or put the nuts on underneath the van, you might be able to use riv nuts instead of the bolts and nuts. Now let's turn our attention to the fuel line for the heater. If you ordered our complete install kits with the add-ons, you'll have all the parts you need for a ProMaster, or Sprinter, or Transit van. The auxiliary fuel port on a ProMaster is very simple to get to. It's located in a little door in the floor between the driver and passenger seats. Getting to the aux fuel port on a Sprinter or a Transit van is definitely more complex. There's tons of videos out there on that particular process, so we won't cover it here, but let's just say that I'm happy to have a ProMaster right now. Okay, here we are in that little compartment in the floor. The first thing I'm gonna do is pull off the cap that comes on the auxiliary fuel tap. Simply press on both sides of the quick disconnect and pull it up and out, super easy. Next, I recommend using one of the 90 degree fittings on this larger side of the fuel tap quick disconnect fitting, and then use a supplied hose clamp to tighten that hose onto the fitting. Now you can push the fitting over the tap until it snaps into place. Next in line is the fuel pump. Be sure to install it such that the direction of the arrow is toward the heater. Basically make sure to get the flow in the right direction. Then we'll use a straight fuel line connector and some fuel hose. Each of these connections needs a hose clamp. On a ProMaster van like this, you can push that semi-rigid plastic fuel hose over the side of the compartment, and typically after a few tries, it'll slip down um, onto the side of the fuel tank, which is a big black plastic tank under this area of the van. Uh, once you do that, you just need enough hose that you can grab onto it and uh, pull it through that space. Well, here we are under the van again. Um, we've got the fuel line coming out from below the tank. Uh, there's a bunch of extra fuel line here that we're gonna be cutting to length. It's probably gonna be routed sort of along here. This is the emergency brake. Um, we're gonna reroute this slightly because we're gonna be having our exhaust there eventually, but we're gonna be putting the pump right about here. Um, there's a place for a riv nut, so the, uh, the pump with its mounting, its squishy mounting bracket will kind of go here. Uh, and then we're gonna bring the gasoline fuel in here and then out to the heater. Uh, you can't really see the heater connections in the shop, but we'll show you that later. Uh, so the pump will be here and then it'll come out into there. Uh, and then we will route the um, combustion air intake from here over to here somewhere, uh, maybe protected by this so that water splashing and debris 
um, is not going to go in there. Uh, you do want a separation between that and then the exhaust. The exhaust will probably come out of here um, and then over to here, probably through our muffler in this region uh, and then out to the sidewall of the van over there. So we'll get to work and we'll show you what we do at the end of this process and how it turns out. All right, this next sequence is me doing all the things under the van as a time lapse. So here I'm attaching the pump to a support beam. Um, I'm using a quarter inch riv nut and a bolt to secure it in place. Uh, note that there's also an arrow on the fuel pump that indicates the flow direction. So be sure to route your fuel hose uh, accordingly. I'm also routing that fuel hose to the inlet of the pump. I'm protecting the fuel hose with the supplied wire loom. I'm connecting the fuel hose to the pump with a straight connector and hose clamps. I'm connecting the fuel pump outlet to the heater inlet, also with the straight connectors and hose clamps. I'm attaching the combustion air intake hose, uh, which is the shorter hose, to the plastic inlet on the bottom of the heater. I'm attaching the longer stainless steel combustion exhaust hose to its port on the bottom of the heater, which is the metal one. And then I'm routing the fuel pump wires from the heater to its short wiring harness, and then connecting the fuel pump wiring harness to the supply wires that we put together into that housing to the wires that come out of the heater. So I'm basically just connecting the wiring harness for the fuel pump uh, to the connector on the end of the wires that are coming out of the bottom of the heater. A few tips on routing stuff under here, under the van. For the combustion air intake, uh, make sure to locate that far away from the combustion exhaust uh, so that you're not sucking uh, any of that exhaust air into your intake. Uh, try to protect it from any splashing or water or debris in this install, I have it semi-protected uh, actually by this shield uh, around the vehicle gas tank fill. And then for the combustion exhaust, be aware that this gets very hot. So route it in a way that keeps it away from other things. Um, this hose also should extend past the sidewall of the van so that the exhaust gases don't pool under the van. It should slope down over its entire route even if it's very slightly, so that any condensation can drain out. And if you end up with any low points, you can drill a quarter inch hole at the bottom of those low points. Try to keep this as short as possible. And here's a big tip. Once you get your fuel hose routed, it's a really good idea to prime that. I simply disconnect the fuel hose connector that goes onto the inlet side of the pump. Then I use a large syringe to pull fuel from the fuel tank through the filter, through the hose, up to the pump location. Then I can reconnect the fuel hose to the pump and retighten that hose clamp. By priming the line like this, it's much more likely that the heater is gonna fire up the first time because the gas is so close to the pump. If you don't do this, uh, you most likely will get a series of faults that we'll discuss later as the fuel pump tries to like displace the air that's in that fuel line. All right, let's dive into the wiring harness. Ideally, you're installing your heater at an early stage of your build before you have any kind of wall panels up. This obviously is gonna make routing the wiring harness much easier for you. And here's another tip. If you might be upgrading to something like a smart temp digital controller in the future, we recommend installing some conduit between your heater location and where the controller might be installed in the future along with like a pull wire. This will make upgrading in the future a lot easier. On the harness, the main plug is this large oval shaped connector. It's pretty distinctive. This plugs into the heater itself. To do so, we're gonna remove the top of the heater by first prying off the front piece. Once you do that, the cover behind it will slide off fairly easily. The main wiring harness connection is down here in the heater. Another big tip, be sure that this plug is well seated. You can see that the handle on the connector sort of snaps into place when it's pressed into the connector completely. This seems super simple, but we've had a lot of customers with strange problems and simply reseating or pushing down on this connector 
made the problems disappear. Okay, back to the wiring harness. If your harness is taped and not in a plastic wire loom like this one, that's another indication that you probably have the European version of the heater kit. Be advised that sometimes they'll change the color of the wire in some of these wiring harnesses. So I'm gonna to try to describe both the wires and the connectors in as much detail as possible, just in case something changes in your version of the harness in the future. The main wiring harness splits off just past the heater connection, right here. At that split, there is a brown wire with a white connector, another white connector with two wires, blue and yellow, and then there's a large, black connector with an orange front. All of these are only used if one, you're going to use a remote temp sensor, or two, are upgrading to the smart temp digital controller. So for now, we're going to ignore them and come back to that when we show the smart temp upgrade later in the video. At the split, one leg of the harness is for the power supply. It has a positive and negative supply cable with ring terminals. The brown wire is the negative, and the red wires are the positive. The positive wire actually has two fuse holders and fuses wired into it for circuit protection. One of those is for the controller, and one of those is for the heater itself. Just beyond those two fuses, those wires combine into one connection with a ring terminal. So at the end of your power line leg, you have one brown negative cable and one red positive cable. Okay, back to the split on the harness near the heater. Uh, the other leg is for the controller. It has a black connector with four wires and a red wire without any connector, just a bare wire. This leg should be routed to where you want the controller to be located, typically on the wall in a convenient location. Once routed, the black connector will plug right into the back of the rheostat controller, and when using this rheostat controller, the red wire is not used at all. This controller leg of the harness is 165 inches. Later in the video, when we upgrade to the digital smart temp controller, we'll need some of these other extra wires routed to the controller location. Remember the tip about conduit if you'll be doing this later in your build after your wall panels are up. Okay, we're ready to turn it on. With the rheostat controller, you simply turn the dial to the right in this case, I'm gonna turn it up all the way because we're running this in Florida in May and it's 86 degrees. Tip, the heaters don't create heat immediately. This is normal. Here's a rundown of the startup sequence. First, the fan turns on at a slowish speed. Meanwhile, the glow pin inside the heater that will create the combustion starts up. After about 40 seconds, the fan will slow down a bit and the fuel pump will start ticking. Within another minute or two, the combustion will begin, the fan speed will raise up and you'll start to feel the warm air. Or, sometimes, it doesn't. There's all kinds of sensors and controls in the heaters for functionality and safety. If anything goes wrong, you'll end up with what's called a fault code. On the rheostat controller, you'll know there's a fault when the green LED light on the controller's knob flashes instead of being solid green. On the smart temp digital controller, you'll see the flashing red LEDs and a fault code on the screen. To read a fault on the rheostat controller, you'll notice that the LED light flashes rapidly five times. Then it will flash much slower for one or more times. You count the slow flashes in order to read the code. So if you see five fast flashes and then two slower flashes, that's a fault code two. In a new installation, it's quite common to get a fault code number one, which is a no start code indicated by one long flash after the five fast flashes. This happens when the heater goes to the startup sequence, as we described, but the combustion fails. Uh, in a new installation, this is typically because the line is not primed and there's a bunch of air that has to get moved through the lines by the pump. Another common code we see is fault code three, which is three slow flashes. That is the under voltage code. And that leads me to another tip. Voltage matters. Typically the AirTop 2000 uses about two to three amps during normal operation. However, when the heater starts up, 
the glow plug is energized and that can pull up to 10 or 11 amps briefly while the heater is starting and, and igniting the burner. So when you go to size your wire and choose the gauge, be sure to size it for that higher amperage so that you don't get any voltage drop. These heaters will actually turn off if they sense that the voltage is below a certain cutoff threshold. The last fault code that we see on a regular basis is fault code seven, seven slow flashes. This is a short circuit in the fuel pump. This can happen if the main wiring harness connection to the heater is not fully seated, or if there's some kind of a short or cut or problem with the wire that goes to the fuel pump out of the combustion air intake. It's common for these to get pinched inside the slit that they exit through. And this is why we recommend drilling that quarter inch hole. In addition to these common faults that we see, there's a complete listing of all of the fault codes in your manual. If you do get any kind of fault code, you can clear the code by simply turning the heater off and then on again. However, if you experience seven consecutive fault or flash codes in a row, the heater will go into a lockout mode and then you have to reset it with the following procedure. To get the heater out of lockout mode, number one, turn the heater on with its controller. Number two, while the heater is still on, remove power by either pulling the fuse in the main wiring harness or the fuse at your branch circuit location. Number three, wait 10 seconds. Number four, turn the heater off with the controller. Number five, restore power to the heater by replacing the fuse. Number six, turn the heater back on. Another tip and something that confuses some of our customers. When the heater is on, the fan will always be running constantly. So even when the heater is not running, you'll still notice the fan blowing at a very low speed. Uh, this is normal, uh, it's very quiet, and it uses very little electricity. Now let's take a look at how you'd upgrade to the digital smart temp controller. Importantly, if you want to make this upgrade, you need the controller itself and the so-called retrofit wiring harness. Uh, we include both of these parts when you purchase a smart temp upgrade for your Wabasto Airtop 2000 STC. To start the upgrade, you need to locate the split in your main wiring harness near that connection to the heater itself. Now, locate the heater side of the retrofit wiring harness that's going to come with your smart temp controller and bring it over to the location of the Y in the main wiring harness near the heater. The large black plug with the orange interior plugs into this matching connector on the smart temp harness. Now locate the white plastic connector with the black thing plugged into it. That black thing is a terminating resistor. You want to remove that and then plug in the matching connector from the smart temp retrofit harness. The brown wire with the white connector is not used. Now find the opposite side of the smart temp retrofit harness. This is the controller side. You need to route this side of the harness to the location of your existing rheostat controller. Once routed, you disconnect the black four pin connector from the back of the rheostat controller and connect it into the retrofit harness like this. Next, you'll find the red wire from the main wiring harness that has a bare end on it, and you will crimp it onto the butt connector that's supplied on this wire from the retrofit harness. Now you can connect up the larger black connector to the smart temp controller. Another tip, we often run supply wires to where the heater will be installed and cut off the ring terminals from the Wabasta wiring harnesses. Then we can use Wago lever lock connectors to bridge our supply wire to the Wabasta wiring harness wires. Here's an example where we have a 12 volt DC positive supply coming from our load center or fuse box and we're connecting it to the 12 volt positive wire on the heater harness and the 12 volt positive on the smart temp controller. Using another lever lock connector, we're bridging the 12 volt negative supply to the wiring harness 12 volt negative on the Wabasto heater. And here's a little wiring diagram showing all these connections uh, from the main wiring harness to the retrofit smart temp harness and the controller itself. Now that the smart temp controller is wired up, let's take a quick look at how to use it. 
When you first turn it on, or it loses power, you have to set the time and date. Any schedules or other information or settings are actually saved during power losses. The button on the top is the on-off switch, and the button on the bottom opens the menu. Note that the menu is only available when the heater is not running. One nice thing about the Smart Temp is that you can switch between heat mode and vent mode or fan mode in the menu. A solid red light means the unit is in heat mode and a solid blue light indicates that it's in vent mode. Flashing red lights means there's a problem or a fault. The dial around the face of the controller allows you to set the desired temperature in one degree increments. Then, to select that temperature, press the bottom menu button. The ambient temperature will show in the middle of the screen and the set temp that you want to heat the area up to shows in the bottom left. If you'd like to dive into all the menu options or learn how to program the heater to start up at a certain time, check out the video we've linked to below in the description from Wabasto all about this controller. All right, let's take a listen to what the heater sounds like when it's running without the air intake silencer or the exhaust muffler. Here we are before those silencing parts were added. The camera is two feet from the side of the van. It's about 75 to 80 decibels when running. And here's the sound under the van near the combustion air intake. Now let's go ahead and install the air intake silencer and the exhaust muffler that come as an add-on in the kits that we sell. We've actually already bolted on the exhaust muffler using a quarter inch riv nut. So all we have to do is cut the stainless steel hose and then attach the cut part to one side of the muffler and then cut a remaining length of hose so that it's long enough to reach the sidewall of the van and point down. And then we'll attach that to the muffler. And then the air intake silencer simply clamps onto the end of your combustion air intake hose uh, and it comes with this plastic clip that you can use to mount it or secure it. Uh, we don't need this since we're just going to use a wire tie in this location. Now that we have the noise reduction parts installed, let's take a listen to the after sound from the same two foot distance. You can hear that it's much quieter at around 59 to 61 decibels. And keep in mind that decibel readings like this are non-linear, so that delta between the before and after is fairly significant. Okay, the last thing we'll touch on is maintenance, which of course is super important. Uh, number one, be sure to operate the heater for at least 20 minutes once a month to make sure that everything stays lubricated and running properly. Number two, make sure that the air intake hose and the air exhaust hose are free of any debris that might cause overheating in the combustion chamber. Number three, make sure that the air intake for the heater and the heated air output is also free of debris so that there's no overheating. Number four, make sure to replace the fuel filter at least once a year and potentially more often if you're in an area where the fuel might be kind of dirty. Well, that's all folks. Thanks for watching. We hope this video was helpful. As always, we appreciate your support of our store. All these Wobasto products are for sale at vanlifeoutfitters.com. And if you like this content, be sure to subscribe to our channel.